Thank you for the opportunity to be your keynote speaker at today's gathering. As I sat down to put my thoughts to paper, it occurred to me that a gathering of this magnitude would usually warrant a keynote speaker with some major gravitas. A congressman, perhaps, an astronaut, a Nobel laureate, an Olympic medalist. I guess all those folks were booked today, so you got the medical examiner. <laughs> That's more like it. I was asked to talk about how scouting has affected the trajectory of my life. I imagine that most of you, like me, think scouting produces far better citizens. And it does. But I would submit to you that scouting does far more than that. Scouting makes better fathers, better husbands, better professionals, and better men. I grew up in a smallish town in northern Iowa at a time where year-round sports and camps of every variety did not compete for a boy's time, the way they seem to today. The one constant in my life growing up was scouting, beginning as a weeblo and continuing through my journey to Eagle Scout. There were only two scout troops in my hometown, the larger of which was overseen by a legendary scoutmaster, Dr. Gene Garrett, or simply Doc, as everyone in town knew him. In his tenure as scoutmaster, which lasted well past the time that his fourth and youngest son became an Eagle Scout, Doc mentored some 76 young men along their own journeys to the rank of Eagle. I was very fortunate to be one of them. It was firmly understood in Troop 212 that if you made it to Life Scout, you were dedicated to becoming an Eagle Scout. And in fact, no one in Troop 212 ever failed on that commitment. Doc was not above going to a scout's home, often unannounced, to meet with a boy and his parents if there were any concerns. <laughs> At a time and in a town where money was tight, Doc ensured that no scout ever missed summer camp or a high adventure opportunity by arranging for any scout who needed it to get his annual physical free of charge. Every fall, scouts chopped and sold firewood, delivered, of course, in Doc's beat-up old Ford pickup, to earn the money we needed for camp. Most of, us, most of us watched Doc in amazement as he seemed to spend every waking moment scouting, and his garage had long ago become a repository for troop equipment. We never really understood how he found the time to practice medicine. In rank order, Doc remains to this day the only man other than my father who has so profoundly affected the choices I have made and the man I have become. Doc died in 2005. Thankfully, I was able to visit him shortly before he died and introduce him to my then three young sons, all of whom are now Eagle Scouts. Like many young men after high school and college, I drifted away from scouting, and I might never have come back, save for fate arranging for me to fall in love with and marry a woman who considers a single mosquito a reason to call it a day, and who considers anything less than a Four Diamond Hotel to be roughing it. <laughs> but she made up for that by giving me three sons who wanted to be Boy Scouts. When our family moved permanently to Minnesota in 2002, my sons joined Pac 479 in the Mustang District and subsequently Troop 479. And frankly, my time as an adult scouter was far more rewarding than my own time as a Boy Scout. I went on innumerable campouts, I spent many a summer week at many points. I paddled the boundary waters. We sailed the Florida Keys. And I was able to hike the high deserts and mountains of Philmont no fewer than three times as a scout leader. Along the way, I served as an assistant scoutmaster and merit badge counselor for several years before becoming our troop committee chair. To this day, some of the best friendships I have ever had have been with my fellow scout dads. But more importantly, I bonded with my own sons in places and through experiences that no other activity or a vocation could compete with. If everything I just told you were the sum total of what I took away from scouting, it would be obvious that the time invested was worth it, and I reaped far more than I sowed. And yet that barely scratches the surface of what scouting has given me and can give you and your sons. Scouting provides a beacon, a compass, a guiding light, and a camaraderie that has lasted for more than a century and transcends national boundaries. So how has scouting affected the long-term arc of my life? Undoubtedly, my scoutmaster influenced my decision to go into medicine. Most people who apply to medical school come with excellent grades, a variety of extracurricular activities such as sports and the arts, and a record of community service. But there is one rather rare accomplishment that sets a young man apart like nothing else, and that is being an Eagle Scout. Becoming an Eagle Scout is not the end of a journey, but the beginning of a commitment to live life by a set of principles that any school, profession, or organization would welcome into its ranks. This first became clear to me when, as I was applying for medical school with little or no way to pay for it, I decided to compete for a military scholarship to medical school. How fortunate for me that being an Eagle Scout 
receive special consideration from the Air Force above and beyond any other accomplishment. After medical school and residency, it was time to honor my commitment to the Air Force. Shortly after going on active duty as an officer in 1999, I got a call from the FBI requesting I go to Kosovo to investigate crimes against humanity, document mass murders, and provide evidence for an international criminal tribunal. As a medical examiner, there is no more laudable way to practice your craft than in the international arena. And so off to Kosovo I went. My team and I lived in tents, eating, drinking, cooking, and cleaning with only those supp supplies we brought ourselves. To almost anyone, this would seem like a daunting undertaking. But if you take away the landmines and the people who wanted to kill us, <laughs> this is what years and years of scout camp and cooking merit badge and hiking and camping merit badge prepared me for, although I never could have imagined that as a boy. We examined scores of bodies, victims of unspeakable atrocities recovered from horrific crime scenes. How many times have the scouts and scouters in this room uttered, by rote memory, the words physically strong and mentally awake? Live by those words because you never know when you might really need them. Had you asked me on September 10th of 2001, I would have told you that the defining moment of my career would be my work in Kosovo. All of that changed on September 11, 2001, a beautiful Tuesday morning in Washington, D.C., where I was stationed, living with my family and working, when hijackers crashed American Airlines Flight 77 into the Pentagon, killing everyone on board the aircraft and 125 people in the building. For the next three months of my life, my partners and I had the almost unimaginable responsibility of identifying thousands of fragments of human remains and returning those to their families. If you have ever recited the points of the scout law, which I promise you that any scout or scouter in this room can do reflexively, I assure you that words like trustworthy and loyal and reverent take on a much deeper meaning after passing through a crucible like 9-11. My wife, my three young sons, and I returned to the Midwest in 2002 at the end of my Air Force commitment. I took a position with Hennepin County looking forward to the much more predictable life of a civilian medical examiner. And then one sultry August evening in 2007, the unthinkable happened right here in our community. An eight-lane interstate bridge at the height of rush hour fell into the Mississippi River. I was on the bridge only a few hours later looking for bodies with my investigators. For the next three weeks, I led one of 75 teams that worked to recover and identify every victim as quickly as possible. One of the reasons my office performed its job so well during that operation was because we had a written plan that we had practiced and we had drilled many times to be ready for just the sort of event we hoped would never happen. What is the scout motto? Be prepared. Yes, my friends, those words have real world meaning. I share these experiences with you not because they say something about me, but for what they say about scouting. Because no matter where you are in life, you have no idea what is around the next corner. But regardless of what you are confronted with, your association with scouting, whether as a boy or as an adult, will make you better prepared for whatever comes your way. Whether in medicine, law, business, academia, the arts, any vocation really, there comes a time in your adult life when no one really cares what you did as a boy. That varsity letter, your chair placement in the Allstate Band, perhaps your high school grade point average may be a great source of pride for you, and they are, no doubt, important accomplishments. But they tell those about you little about what you have become decades later. There is one blurring exception to this, however, and that is being an Eagle Scout. The reason is simple. Being an Eagle Scout is not something you did. It is not something you were. It is something you are. Being an Eagle Scout is not a milestone that you passed as you grew. It's a commitment recognized even by those who know almost nothing else about scouting that you accepted to uphold a core set of principles that do not diminish with age. And so even now, nearly 34 years after my last board of review as a Boy Scout, the words Eagle Scout in the year 1983 are still on my resume. That matters a great deal to me. It mattered to the Air Force. It mattered to the panel of experts that interviewed me for my position to be Hennepin County's medical examiner. On occasion, it has even mattered to the attorneys questioning me and the juries listening to my answers when I testify under oath in court. I do want to share one especially brilliant, or so I thought, intersection of my profession as a medical examiner with my avocation as a scouter. Our troop had a long tradition of cold weather camping, 
Every winter, we would pack off to somewhere snowy enough to build snow huts, then crawl into them to sleep outdoors in sub-zero weather. We even had a feature article about this, our troop, in Boy's Life. Since this required time-intensive wrapping of our sleeping bags in waterproof tarps and used a lot of duct tape, I got to thinking, what do I have access to that would be waterproof, durable, reusable, and designed to accommodate a full-grown man? <laughs> That's right, a body bag. So much to the amusement of the scouts in our troop, I brought a body bag to our winter camp out one year and proceeded to climb in for what I thought would surely be a night of ease and comfort and likely my ticket to fame and fortune with this newly discovered winter camping miracle. I learned three very difficult lessons that long and cold night. Ripstop heavyweight plastic is very loud in sub-zero temperatures. Body bags are not really designed for their contents to be rolling around or turning over. And I probably should have thought of this last point in advance. The zipper on a body bag isn't really designed for ergonomic use by the occupant of the bag. <laughs> but I still had a very good time with my sons and with my troop. E.O. Wilson is arguably the greatest living naturalist, field biologist, and conservationist in America, and he's a retired professor at Harvard University. He knows more and has written more about ants than anyone who has ever lived. He is a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning author and he has been named one of Time Magazine's 25 most influential people in America. He is a hero of mine. He's also an Eagle Scout. In fact, he's a distinguished Eagle Scout, an honor he shares with men who have walked on the moon, Medal of Honor recipients, Nobel laureates, in total fewer than 2,200 men. To what does Wilson attribute his success? In a delightful book review, for the New York Times, published in 2014, 70 years after he became an Eagle Scout, Wilson notes that in all of high school, he read only two books cover to cover. One of them was the 1942 Boy Scout Handbook. Wilson writes, the Handbook for Boys expresses the best of the American ethos, unparalleled for its brilliance and pedagogy and its uncompromising declaration of democratic ideals. It espouses individualism, responsibility, empowerment, and the philosophy of taking hold and learning by doing. He goes on to write, I'm well aware that to many the Boy Scouts seem unsophisticated and outdated, but I ask doubters at least to consider this. If asked to decide who would be successful in life and exceptionally useful to society, the graduating senior of an elite New England prep school or an Eagle Scout in Kansas, I'd vote for the Eagle Scout. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today and recognize you for your support of Boy Scouts. Scouting is an opportunity every boy should have. One final thought from Harry Truman. What a greater nation this would be if the principles of scouting could be woven more closely into our daily lives. The Boy Scouts of America is making a vital contribution to the character building of our boys and young men. Let us work together to make the program of the Boy Scouts available to every American boy. Thank you and have a great morning, everyone.